You're listening to ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm at the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, keeping my eye on Jonah Lehrer, who's busy signing copies of his latest book called How We Decide. It examines the science of decision-making, and like his first book, called Proust Was a Neuroscientist, it reflects Jonah's interest in the murkier workings of the human brain. Ah, here he is. Jonah Lehrer, welcome to ThoughtCast. What's the difference, if any, between the brain and the mind? Oh, wow. Start off with an easy question. Yeah, I mean, there clearly is a very real difference. I, th- I think ultimately the difference comes down to a level of description. I think when we talk about the brain, we're talking about neurons, kinase enzymes, neurotransmitter, synaptic proteins, the, the wet stuff of the brain, those three pounds of gelatinous flesh inside the skull. When we talk about the mind, I think we're talking about what the brain generates, what those three pounds become. You know, the the sensation of being self-conscious, of of being able to think about our thoughts, reflect on our thoughts, pay attention to the emotions. You know, so the emotion of fear, for example, as a mental representation, as it's perceived in the mind, is the emotion of fear. It's scary. It's it's racing pulse. It's the sweaty palms. It's it's the sweat above the lip. It's that that is how the mind perceives emotion. And when you put people in a brain scanner, what you see is that that emotion of fear sometimes comes from a brain area called the amygdala, which tends to generate these feelings of fear and anxiety. So I think that illustrates how ultimately what they are is different levels of 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 description. I'm not sure whether the word mind or brain is the right one to use here, but have you ever tried to rewire your own brain, perhaps get it out of a rut, learn new ways of thinking, learn how to feel something differently? Good question. I think one of the things I advocate in the book is something called metacognition, which is a fancy word for something we do every day all the time, which is think about thinking. And I think one of the surprising insights of modern neuroscience is being that metacognition, they tend to study this in terms of Buddhist monks, who what do Buddhist monks do all day is they practice metacognition. They think about how they think and they practice controlling their thoughts. And and they found that this this can actually profoundly change the structure of the brain in the way brain areas that we thought were beyond conscious control, brain areas like the amygdala, that the brain area that reacts to f- scary stuff outside, um, can actually, by, by simply thinking about how you think, you can change the way these brain areas work. You can change the actual structure of, of this organ inside your head. So, so I think that's something I, you know... Just, just as a matter of living, as trying to think, as trying to make better decisions, I think you're inevitably changing the way your brain works, that the mind feeds back onto the brain. Um, that I, you know, I think one of the illusions, um, one of the popular illusions, is that it's a one-way street between the brain and the mind, that it's just the brain generates the mind and that's it. I think one of the surprising findings about neuroscience is that it's actually a loop, it's a feedback loop, that the brain creates the mind, but the mind also feeds back. Every thought you think is manifested as a change in neurotransmitters you know, synapses, synaptic activity, etc. Um, so, so, so I think by, by simply trying to be metacognitive, I think that's a crucial component of being a good decider, being a good decision maker, adjusting your thought process, the task at hand. You, what you're actually doing is changing the way your brain works. You've written a lot about brain activity. Jonah, what kind of brain activity do you think was going on on Wall Street during the latest economic boom, or should I call it a bubble? Uh, oh, I think it was certainly a bubble. Um, I think it was a mirage of a boom. People stop thinking about losses and they take these rewards for granted. And then of course the bubble implodes and that's what we're living through right now, which is this one way to think about it is a massive prediction error failure is 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 we expected the market to always go up and now it's going down and so there's a panic. We all want to get out of it. Um, I think the other big thing we're looking at right now is, you know, we're we're living through times, very uncertain times, and I think this remains one of the big mysteries of decision making is the effect of uncertainty. I think it's a really un, undercovered subject is why uncertainty is so so disorienting to the brain, makes it feel so bad. Why we so crave certainty, knowing for sure, and when we don't know for sure, when we don't know if Citibank will survive next quarter or if the stock market is going to take another twenty percent, that paralyzes people. So they don't want to invest. They 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 don't want to take a chance. So so I. I think what you also found is the reason these models for evaluating risk, like subprime mortgage debt, I think the reason they were so misleading is because they gave people the the, the illusion of certainty. They they led people to believe that there was no risk, that because they could quantify the risk, measure it, that somehow that meant there really was no risk. And then they stopped questioning the, the underlying assumptions of these models, which is, what if housing prices fall? Then all of a sudden, 
the, these these there's there's going to be massive foreclosures and this debt isn't such a sure thing. So so I so I think you you see this complicated stew of variables and when they all come together, what you get is I think a colossal bubble, which is what's unwinding right now. What about self-willed delusion, the desire not to think about the possibilities, the extremities of the risks they were taking, a way of blocking their minds from that possibility. Well, well I think that's, you know, that's a very well-studied psychological phenomenon. It goes back to cognitive dissonance and, and the work of Leon Fessinger in the 50s. Um, and I think that's a basic property of the human mind, not, not one of our more outstanding properties, which is that we tend to filter the world to confirm what we already believe or would like to believe. So if you really want to believe that, that these debts are safe, if your career depends on it, if they've made you lots of money, then you're going to find ways to not think about the information which may contradict that belief, which, which might suggest that maybe housing prices might fall, maybe there is a housing bubble. Um, and, and so that's a clear example, I think, of, of, of really how we filter the world to confirm what I believe. And this isn't just about Wall Street. This is why liberals watch MSNBC and conservatives watch Fox. This is a basic property of how we think and how we process reality. David Brooks of the New York Times calls this recession a, quote, mental event. And I'm wondering, what about the belief in capitalism itself uh, as an efficient, rational, self-regulating marketplace? What kind of a mental event is that? Well, I think certainly what we're seeing, and I think what a lot of this decision-making research talks about, uh, and I, I describe in the book, is that humans aren't rational agents. So in a sense, the founding assumption of modern economics, of the rational agent model, turns out to not be true when you look at the actual brain, when you look at the flesh that drives our decisions. So, so I certainly think, um, you know, it's, it's time for economists, my advice, and, you know, I'm certainly no expert, um, but you know, you can talk to a bunch of economists, neuroeconomists, behavioral economists who would make the same argument. He said it's time for economics to basically adopt the position of just, just about every other science, which is that you begin at the bottom. You begin by understanding the, the most micro phenomena, by understanding how humans actually make decisions about which products to buy in the supermarket, trying to understand the consumer at its most essential, and then you extrapolate upwards from there. Emotion is often considered sort of to be uh, a problem in decision making or has historically been and you're attempting to sort of bring it out of the shadows and give it some credit. Yeah. But when you think about gut decision making, isn't there actually a brain in the gut? You, you've got lots of brain cells in your gut. That's, ab that's absolutely true. You've got, you've got billions of brain cells in your gut. Um, and I think that's an important part of registering emotion is, is emotions really begin as bodily signals. The feeling of fear, in a sense, is the, the brain's perception of this rising pulse, sweaty palms. Um, and this idea goes back to William James in the 19th century. Um, and I think that's a crucial component of, of registering that emotion in the first place. I mean, it seems to be more of a continuum, emotion, reason. Absolutely. I think you can't have one without the other. Um, that, that this neat distinction we've had ever since Plato turn, turns out to not be true at all. And that if you cut people off from their emotional brain, from, from, from these emotions we all take for granted, what you see isn't that they become rational agents, philosopher kings. They instead become pathologically indecisive. Um, that, that pure reason, as I put in the talk, is a disease. Um, so I think that suggests that, that in order to be rational, you actually have to be very emotional, which, which is very counterintuitive. It goes against lots of theories, economic theory, classic cognitive science, certainly lots of philosophy. Um, and yet you know, when you look at the brain, you see that these two things are emulsified together. Well, thank you for your time, Jonah Laird. Thank you. You've been listening to ThoughtCast. Please leave us a comment at thoughtcast.org. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us.